Okay, so uh, I will spend this minute just to uh, welcome everyone to this uh, session or the third session on epidemiology and specifically spreading. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Peter Holm from the Tokyo Institute of uh, Technology. He is uh, very well known uh, for uh, his work on uh, temporal networks uh, and uh, epidemiological studies. So it's a pleasure to have him uh, here today. And he's going to discuss with us about uh, hierarchies uh, of importance, estimates in temporal network uh, epidemiology. So thank you very much, Peter, and uh, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you. Let's go. Hello everyone, I'm Petter Olme from Tokyo Institute of Technology. I will talk about importance measures in temporal network epidemiology. But first, let me start with an apology, because when I submitted the abstract to, to this conference, I, my work wasn't completely finished, but I thought I had the end in sight. But as sometimes can happen, I went into a cloud and I'm still not out of it. But I think this will be an interesting talk for you anyway. But because I don't have so many strong results, I want to start with some entertainment. And I want to start with the timeline of my work or the background of my work, so starting from the first programmable computer, the ENIAC. So actually, the second project to run on ENIAC was codenamed Monte Carlo. And that was the first uh, simulation using random numbers. And this started a trend uh, of using random numbers in research, which reached uh, computational epidemiology a few years later. This is the first paper about computational epidemiology, actually not using a computer simulation, but random numbers anyway, by Helen Abbey. And another important work was the this paper, especially important for uh, finding important spreaders in networks. And I will come back to that, introducing the core group concept. And the first paper using an explicit network to argue a case in network epidemiology was the first paper to claim that HIV is a sexually transmitted disease. And uh, it also introduced the, the concept of patient zero. So you can see the node with the uh, label zero here when the author showed this plot to that particular person, he learned that he was number zero. And when he talked to media, he referred to himself as patient zero. That's the background of this uh, concept. And then in the 90s, we had this pioneering work by Miriam Kretschmar, uh, which was the first uh, paper to use a network model to tune the network structure and observe the impact of uh, disease simulation. Now back to the core group idea. So the core group was introduced to explain that a uh, population can be uh, under the epidemic threshold in the population as a whole, still a disease can survive. And the disease in question was the gonorrhea that they study. Now this means that something of a paradox that being important is of course being a member of a core group a core group of people with like a high risk behavior that is also very interconnected but at the same time if you vaccinate a person even a person in a core group just one person nothing will happen so in that sense people are insignificant this connects to another idea, which is probably the kind of most reinvented concept in network science, which is called vitality, especially in network epidemiology. And this is the idea that the importance of a node could be measured by the impact of deleting the node. And so you study the, say the outbreak size with and without the node and measure the difference. I mean, you will find that nobody is important. So, importance cannot be attributed to the impact of individual persons. Another kind of interesting thing, uh, a little bit paradoxical thing, is that 
technically speaking, you cannot rank the nodes in order of importance. So this plot, if you imagine that important in this case, means that you should reduce the size of the largest connected component as much as possible. And you do that with only deleting one node, then it will be the one saying n equal one here. If you delete two nodes, it will be like n equal two and so on. So if you want to delete say five nodes, you won't delete any one of the, the ones that you would delete if you delete four nodes. Uh, or as the title of the paper says, the ranking influential spreaders is an ill-defined problem. Now, this is maybe not so uh, serious because I think especially in the heterogeneous network, uh, like uh, using a ranking actually would work. Uh, but, but anyway, this is something to keep in mind. So what you really want to do is, is something that is case dependent. So it, uh, the most important nodes should be defined with a specific disease in mind and a specific inter set of intervention scenarios. And then you can come to conclusion, maybe the size of the outbreak, if you notice the source would be the measure you want or being a member of a core group or, or so on. Or for us theorists, I think the problem should could be stated something like the, we want to construct a simple principle measure for, for say, SIR simulations that capture as many of these ideas as possible. So it has to be a compromise, but what is the best compromise? Okay, uh, so this is a bit of a side note. So for my work, when I do simulations, I consider the SIR model on empirical temporal networks. So exactly how to do it is described in this preprint. I use compartmental models, dividing people into classes with respect to the disease. So susceptible meets infectious, could result in an infection. And then after some time, the infectious can be recovered again. This has to be coupled with a model for the contact patterns. And I use a temporal network saying like who is in contact with whom at what time. And now to get to the importance measure, I will go back to my postdoc days when I published a paper about the reachability. So reachability is uh, of one node at one time is the fraction of the network that you can reach through time respecting paths. So in this plot, for example, uh, it's a timeline of a temporal network. So each horizontal line is a person and each vertical line uh, shows a contact. And then this red and gray lines kind of shows like a map of like the rest of the network, which node is reachable from this node at this time. Then reachability will be the kind of uh, fractional area of red in this case. Uh, so you also average out the time over the entire data set. And then you can think of two different versions, the upstream version, which shows like what nodes that can reach me at a time and the downstream showing like uh, what nodes can I reach. So this is our starting point to build like a hierarchy of importance measures. The starting, we can call it a temporal network level and we, we can go up to the uh, disease level or the disease simulation level, SIR level. And now upstream reachability would correspond to uh, the number of like the fraction of nodes that can infect you or the risk of getting infected, the fraction of runs in the SIR that would infect you. And the downstream would correspond to the size of the infection tree below you. And you can go from this temporal network level in the opposite direction to the more fundamental quantities, something like the duration of presence in the data or the total number of contacts you are involved in. You can also imagine going from SIR to higher to kind of unify uh, the U and D measures, probably multiplying because these are relatively independent measures that both are important. But I'm not going to go into detail about that. I think for the time being, we can keep this separate. That would be better. But now 
let's go to the result or my confusion. So I will show you the conclusion and the confusion before the evidence. So unfortunately, like the for this to work, for this hierarchy, the idea of a hierarchy to work, then of course the uh, measures at adjacent levels in the hierarchy should be higher correlated than measures far far away in the hierarchy. And this doesn't really hold in general. I mean, it really doesn't hold in general. But maybe if it's uh, true in some region of parameter space, that would be okay. And this is maybe true, kind of, but then on the other hand, the correlations are not that high. Correlations between reachability and this uh, SIR importance measures. So here I show the Kendall Tau correlation between the downstream reachability and the size of the downstream infection tree. This is on the temporal network SIR model is effectively a two parameter model. So on the X axis is the transmission probability and on the Y axis is the recovery rate. This is for the social patterns gallery data, one of the days. And we can see that the correlations are never super high and they are the, but they are the highest in the region where we have the kind of intermediate size outbreak. So now on the right side, I show the average outbreak size. So that's at least the most interesting region. And in that sense, it's a good thing. This shows the correlation not with the downstream reachability and capital D, uh, but the total number of contacts of each node. So this is more kind of lower level importance measure. Uh, and it shows higher uh, correlation, which is a, kind of like a problem, but it's uh, at least in the interesting region, uh, the downstream reachability shows higher correlations. But then for other days of the uh, social patterns gallery data for other data sets, things look even more ugly. So, so this is a case where uh, the highest correlation is not where the, uh, we have this intermediate outbreak sizes and also that the, the correlation with the strength, the total number of contacts is, is higher. So I'm not going to continue this boring you with this kind of half complete results. Instead, if you're really interested, I invite you to collaborate. So please hit me up. And otherwise, thanks for listening to this exercise. And uh, also thanks to my collaborators, in particular Li Tao from the Southwest University in Chongqing, and uh, to many other people that I've discussed. So actually, I don't even know. I don't remember everyone that I discussed this with. But, th but thanks anyway, and thanks for listening. So thank you very much, Peter. Mm, there is time for questions. You invited to, to write someone to, so to write to, I see, Mateus? Yeah? Yes. Go so on, please. Uh, if I may ask, uh, so in the last two plots, the high correlations were occurring for uh, lower probability of transmission so it seems like for larger distances. So as uh, you said, so how does it relate with uh, this uh, failed expectation at with the, that the correlation should decay with distance? And what what would be the this definition of distance? Okay, so so distance by distance I meant like in this hierarchy of different uh, types of uh, measures, like the most uh, kind of fundamental. The like simplest measures are should be kind of strongly correlated with the kind of level above, and the level above should be more correlated with the level above. But now there's kind of it, it skips one level, so so the uh, SIR importance is kind of more strongly correlated with just the uh, total number of contacts. So uh, like uh, I, I I was 
hoping or thinking that this uh, reachability would kind of be more strongly correlated. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mateus, for, for the question. Any more questions? I don't see anyone else. So let's let's thank uh, Peter again. Thank you very much, Peter. And I take uh, 30 seconds just for this last minute request by the next speaker, who is uh, Sina Sajadi, uh, talking about uh, k-means clustering method for co-infective spreading risk calculation. So Sina, uh, give me just a few seconds. Uh, so uh, can I try if, because I tried earlier, I wasn't able, so maybe I can, maybe I'm, I mean, I'm not the host yet. Right? Yeah, you are not the host and uh, uh, I, I cannot make you host. I don't know why I have no powers. Uh, oh, really? So it's not, so, so the problem is perhaps not from my okay, side. Okay, so now someone, yeah, probably Argiris uh, made you host. Yes, yes, I'm sorry. Okay. Oh, so can I... Oh, let me see if I can share my screen right now. By the way, I have downloaded it. So if you cannot, oh. I can. Okay, it says host disabled build at, uh, attendee screen sharing. I'm, I'm still not capable. Okay, don't worry. I can uh, I can do it this, this for you. Okay, okay, then I'll get back in Q&A. Okay. So I should ask if you can see only the window correctly. Yeah. Yes. And uh, uh, if you you don't <clears throat> you didn't don't listen to the sound, just let me know through the chat. Okay. Well, uh, I, I I cannot listen to the to the sound uh, even on my laptop. I don't understand why. Uh, okay, can you, maybe, can you hear your maybe, sound oh, on your laptop? Yeah, I do have. Uh, maybe I can, I can give the sound online version. Okay. Yes, Sina co-host can share screen too. So. Um, can can I narrate on the video? So play the video, uh, and I'll narrate the video. So you want to speak while the video is going? Yeah, on? I think this is the only option right now. Well, as you wish. So uh, thank you very much for your attendance. I am Sina, master's graduate at Sharif University of Technology, and I am delighted to give a talk on Kamis clustering. So uh, we have a spreading model consisting of two different diseases spreading. A can uh, infect a susceptible agent with probability P uh, to an agent infectious with A. And uh, there, the same also applies for B with the same probability. And we also have this uh, co-infection where agent B can infect agent A uh, with probability Q to become an agent which is infectious of AB, uh, actually both diseases. And we also have a recovery uh, in process, which uh, turns them to in uh, lower case. This is just for uh, demonstration. And we use three different empirical networks from sociopattern, they're very long. So we make use of uh, different types of shuffling, uh, some I've taken from this paper. One is what we created. Uh, you can see different visualizations over them. So the first four actually preserve the time series and the time distribution. Uh, but the last one uh, is the opposite. It uh, destroys the time distribution, but uh, preserves the ordering. But the first four uh, randomize the ordering. Uh, and well, you can see that every edge is labeled uh, with the timestamps which it occurs. And uh, there is another representation with e each uh, node is a um, horizontal line and a contact over the time is shown with a vertical line. So we will make use of these different types of shuffling to see their uh, 
uh, effect on uh, the uh, spreading dynamics. So this is a uh, distribution of our results for a specific case of a hospital uh, with a uh, type of shuffling and a set of parameters. Uh, P here is our control parameter. Uh, here we have uh, uh, row AB, which is the y axis, uh, and uh, it depicts the number of agents which are recovered from both diseases in the end of our simulation. And the x axis is the frequency uh, at which that occurs. So um, if you... Uh, plot this uh, histogram for different values of uh, control parameter P, uh, you will get this heat map. Uh, so they have the share Y axis. Uh, the color pl plot actually uh, corresponds to the X axis, which is the uh, frequency. And uh, the X axis of the left diagram is our control parameter. And uh, this gray dashed line indicates the average of our uh, simulations. So it's by average for each control parameter, how many uh, diseases are infected with uh, both uh, A and B. And the gray, gray dashed area actually corresponds to the same uh, area of uh, data points in, 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 the both, in both diagrams. Uh, as we can see, this average is not a very good indicator of our results uh, because we can see two different branches over here. Uh, but uh, the average is not very informing uh, and it does not actually give us information about uh, the probability or uh, the size of the, uh, actually the probability and uh, the height, which is row AB of uh, the higher branch. So what to do with this? Uh, we uh, actually uh, resort to uh, another type of uh, visualizations. Uh, so uh, we actually are sharing this, um, demonstrating the same uh, uh, data uh, from the, um, me, uh, the the diagram in the middle uh, on two axes, one is row AB, which is the same, and uh, the one the other one is row A, uh, the number of agents which are infected with only one disease, and we can see that the data is concentrated over uh, three different areas. Uh, one uh, we could assume is uh, the realizations because each dot is a realization in which uh, none of the uh, infectious uh, diseases were able to uh, transmit and create an outbreak and they have died off early. Uh, the ones to the right are the ones in which only one has managed to create an outbreak and the ones uh, on the top, top left, are the ones in which both diseases have uh, created an outbreak. Mm, so mm, to uh, classify these results, we use uh, the K-means clustering method. This method uh, is an unsupervised method it uh, only needs the number of clusters. And intuitively, we have the number of clusters uh, as we analyze. So uh, based, on this, uh, based on these values, based on the, uh, the clusters that we obtain, we are able to uh, actually define two uh, new parameters. So this red cluster here, we call it the outbreak branch, which uh, depicts the uh, realizations in which uh, we have two, uh, two of, both actually diseases have uh, spread. Uh, as we had a great outbreak. So we have PAB, which is the probability of a, uh, an outbreak to occur. And it's actually proportional to the proportion of the uh, realizations which fall in the red one. And AB bar is how bad an outbreak would be if it occurs. And it's the uh, average of uh, the red dots over the y-axis or row AB. Based on these two parameters, so, um, so we actually conduct the simulation and this uh, systematic measurement for uh, all of the uh, different uh, networks and two cases of co-infection and uh, independent infection, which is Q equal P and Q equal one. And uh, well, in the interest of time, I think we will get to the summary. So if we categorize the shuffling methods over two different types, in a event time shuffle, which actually preserves the ordering, but uh, randomizes the inter-event times and ordering sh shuffling, which uh, preserves the timestamps, but randomizes the uh, ordering. Uh, we will obtain these results. For, for the case of co-infection, uh, we can see that if we randomize the sequence of the events or uh, causal relationships uh, between the edges, uh, the 
uh, the pervasiveness of the outbreak will be worse. So we will get a higher average if it outbreak occurs. But for the case of an independent infection, this is not the case. It could uh, occur in both ways. Um, uh, it could either increase or decrease. Uh, for uh, intervent time distribution, if we randomize that, but uh, if we preserve the ordering, uh, there is no strong impact on the outbreak size, uh, but the probability of outbreak can change. Uh, and uh, the main result is that uh, averaging is not a very good indicator. And if we just had averaged the results, we wouldn't have obtained uh, the different clusters and we would have, have been able to uh, see how probability and the size of outbreak can change. So uh, please take a look at our preprint here. Um, the source of our data is SocioPattern, and this is a software that we uh, created for uh, modeling the spreading dynamics on both static and temporal networks. Thank you for your attention. Uh, this is my email and this is my uh, blog. You can get a glimpse of my other projects and I would like to indicate that I am open for collaboration. So in case you're interested, uh, please contact me. Thank you. Thank you very much I, I, for the nice talk and uh, for the way it, is, it was given. I agree with Iroki in the comments uh, that uh, the, the live narrative was, was amazing. Uh, uh, thank you. I mean, uh, yeah, I, it was unexpected, but uh, hopefully worked out. <laughs> well, great, 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 great job. So uh, there is any, any question from, from the audience? Anyone? Not, uh, not directly, not evidently. So uh, just uh, uh, one very, very uh, rapid question from, um, from me. So did you see any, uh, any difference uh, in terms of, um, um, of dynamics or, or the effect of the dynamics uh, from um, the, the different data sets? I mean, uh, I have worked recently with uh, some of these data sets that you have mentioned. And I remember that uh, the, um, the, the conference in Dublin, can be uh, from the social patterns, uh, had very different scaling uh, between the number of ages and the number of uh, nodes. Uh, and uh, it was reflected in different uh, structural, also dynamical properties. Uh, I was looking for something about synchronization. So I am curious if you have seen something similar in terms of uh, qualitative uh, differences with respect to other data sets, uh, if you have analyzed it. Yeah, indeed. Uh, that is a very good question. For the hospital, we actually, uh, mostly we observe multiple branches, more than two actually. And this is was specific to the case of hospital. So uh, we thought that it could be because of the small size effect. Uh, but also the school, the primary school data set was also interesting because uh, mostly uh, the probability of infection, which is one of our uh, macro parameters, I would say, and also <coughs> the uh, pervasiveness of uh, outbreak, which are the two things that we obtained using k means clustering, they had very, very similar patterns, which was not the case for other data sets. So I'm not sure what to make of this, but uh, yeah, and this was indeed in there. Yeah, thank you very much. It was just a, a curiosity. So thank you. if there is, uh, there are no more questions from the audience, uh, uh, let's thank uh, seen again for uh, for the nice talk, and uh, let's uh, let's move to the next speaker, uh, Argiris uh, Dimo. Hello. Argiris, are you ready? Yes. Let me share my screen. Okay, fantastic. So he's going to talk about the simulating SIRX model on network based on real data. So are you are you ready? Argis, you are on mute. So I uh, I can listen to your replies. Okay. Setting focus. 
an epidemiologic a simulation of an epidemiological model on networks. As we all know, COVID-19 has huge impact on economy and society. So it is reasonable that a lot of researchers have been focused on epidemiology. And in this study, we will simulate an epidemiological model. So Argiris, we don't see the by <clears throat> We don't see your video. Uh, I'm sorry. Could I present the uh, last so I can solve the problem? Okay, so we can switch in order to stay on time. I, I agree yes. on that because we have to be strict. So okay. I kindly ask uh, Anlin Sun uh, to jump in. I see that Anlin is, uh, is Yeah, there. I'm here. Okay, great. Uh, but uh, you cannot share the screen. So Argiris, you have to allow him to, to share the screen. I am the chair, but I have no powers. <laughs> okay, Anlin. So okay, now you have now I can share my screen. Yes. Share. Okay, so, you see the screen. Let's fly some window. Okay. Can you see my screen now? Uh, it's uh, stuck on the st starting. Uh, screen or sorry or let me uh, of the keynote sorry okay now now we see it uh, full screen <clears throat> is that okay so can you see the second page yes contact and tracing with app okay thank you so okay go so go on okay thank you hello everyone i'm halim from uh, queen mary Uni university of london and I will present our recent work uh, jointly done with uh, with Janitra Bianchini, Giacomo Repsidi, and Alex Arenas about the message passing approach to epidemic tracing and mitigation with apps. So let's introduce the background first. Um, as you know, the uh, uh, current pandemic of COVID-19, uh, many countries are using some digital ways to uh, try to mitigate the spreading. So contact tracing with uh, mobile apps is a very uh, uh, common way. So here is a, um, a mechanism proposed by Apple and Google. So more or less all these apps work in a similar me me mechanism. So it's saying that we all adopt this app on our uh, phone. So uh, if I have I tested positive, I will upload my status saying I'm positive now. And the app will automatically send the message to anyone else who has closely contact with me. And also they should have this app. So they will receive the message saying, you have closely contact with someone who has uh, who has been infected. So you should isolate yourself to stop the propag uh, further propagation. So here is the uh, three of the apps I found in the app store. So the first one is NHS for England and the second one is Germany. And the third one is for Japan. So. Um, Many countries are using this app to trying to do the work, but um, does it really work? So we want to uh, propose a model for an epidemic spreading process with these kind of apps. So uh, here is a, a basic information of the model. So we consider a, a, a community with any individuals. And if two individuals have closely contact with each other, and there will be a link between two individuals in this figure. And as you can see, well, uh, the, uh, there are yellow individuals and blue individuals. So the blue ones means uh, they don't have, a, they haven't adopted this app. So we assign their, them a variable saying ti equals to zero. And the yellow guys means, well, I have adopted this app. It means that we, we assign the ti equals one to him. So let's look at a detailed spreading process with this contact tracing app. So if this uh, epidemic starts from someone with the app, so that's the first guy, and he has the probability, I say a P, a certain probability to infect two kind of his neighbors. So this guy and this guy. Uh, can you see my pointer? 
Sorry, Anlin, but we are uh, a bit struggling with uh, uh, with the presentation. We see just uh, the starting slide. Uh -oh. So uh, I guess that uh, all of us were thinking that you were describing just this slide, but we don't see okay. any change. Uh, no, so, so, sorry. So, I have, uh, so like it's stuck in the first slice. Um, yeah, where is the yellow try to do it, do it again. Sorry. Okay, now, now now we see another one. Can you change it, please? Just to see if it's uh... sorry. Let's let me come back to like the second page in case you, you haven't seen it. Um... Okay, that's okay now. That's the same as before. Can you try to change a slide just now, just to see if it works? Yeah, okay, now it, it works. Now it works. Thank you. Okay, so I, I, I shall come back from here. Okay. Uh, so that is a model we consider. Uh, we have n individuals in the community, and there are two kind of individuals with the app and without the app. So we indicated them with the blue and the yellow colors in this in this figure, and if they have closely contact with each other, there will be a link between them. So that's the basic background, and now let's look closely as the detail of the epidemic spreading process. So, and now you can see my pointer, right? Yes. Okay, thank you. So if the uh, spreading process starts from someone with the app, so he have a probability, I say P, uh, certain probability to, to infect two kinds of his neighbors. So neighbor with the app and neighbor without the app. So they will be infected in the next step. Uh, but for this guy, because he has the app, and so when he tests positive, the second guy will know instantly that the first guy uh, was tested positive. So he will isolate himself to stop the further propagation. But for this guy, he doesn't have the app. So he, he won't know he has closely contact with someone who has tested positive before the symptom shows. So for the first guy, he will isolate himself. So uh, the the further propagation is stopped. But for this guy, it does know. So the propagation can carry on. So his neighbor can be uh, infected with his probability P. And if the uh, spreading process starts with someone without the app, so basically no one will know, none of his neighbor will know uh, they have contact with someone who has test positive. So they will be infected anyway. And as they don't know, they have been infected so they will continue the propagation to their neighbors. So that is the um, uh, basic mechanism of the contact tracing, uh, the spreading process with this contact tracing app. So we can write down a message passing equation to this process. And let's introduce a new variable saying sigma i to j, uh, indicating that node i spread the virus node j with its probability. And we can write such a, a message passing equation. As you can see, there are two terms at the right-hand side of the equation, and one term with P2i and second term with P1 minus Ti. So P2i, Ti equals to one, meaning that I have the app. So the first term meaning that node i sent a message to node j, and node i have adopted the app. So that's corresponding to these two scenarios. Uh, i is a yellow guy, and i can be infected by a yellow guy or a blue guy. But only when I'm infected by a blue guy, I can continue the propagation because uh, if I'm infected by a yellow guy with the app, I will know I'm infected. So I will isolate myself to stop the, pro the propagation. So this means only at least one of the blue guys infect me, and then I can continue the propagation. So that's the, the first term. And for the second term, so it's saying that uh, the node I is this blue guy. It doesn't have the app. So he can be infected by anyone to stop uh, to to continue the propagation, no matter if they have the app or not. So that's the second term. After this equation, we can write down um, a, a marginal probability sigma i, meaning that a node i is infected. So it can be uh, written as one minus the product of one minus sigma l to i, meaning that at least one of my neighbor sent me a message, sent, or one of my neighbors uh, infected me. Finally, we look at the fraction of infected individuals, and it is given by the sum over all the, all the sigma i and over the total number of individuals n. 
So how to do, deal with this equation? For this equation, the epidemic threshold is achieved when the dominating eigenvalue of this modified non-backtracking matrix B uh, equals to one. So we can uh, linearize this, this equation uh, near the critical point to, to obtain a matrix form of, of this equation. And B is a, non -backtracking, a modified non-backtracking matrix and is related to the uh, non-backtracking matrix of the network, which is indicated by A. So, uh, but if you look, look closely at this equation, it needs a perfect knowledge of the TI and the network structure. Meaning that I need to know who has closely contact with whom, and I need to know who has adopted the app and who did it. Who did it. So it's a very um, hard to, to achieve in a real world scenario. So if we don't have a perfect knowledge of TI, I don't know who have adopted the app or who have not, but we can make assumption, minimum assumption, saying that the TI is only a function of a uh, uh, degree of this node K. Then we can uh, write down an averaged message passing equation by introducing these two variables, sigma T and sigma N. The sigma T indicating that uh, sigma note I send a message to J and I have adopted the app and sigma N means I send a message to J and I doesn't have the app, okay? So we can use a very similar way to write down two uh, message passing equations and also the marginal for uh, a sigma I. And we can use a similar mechanism to, to obtain a critical threshold by linearizing this equation. Furthermore, if we don't have the perfect knowledge of the network structure and we want to perform an average over an uncorrelated network ensemble, so uh, we can write two um, uh, equations as follows. So SN prime and ST prime. SN prime meaning that's a, the probability following a link, we reach an infected node without the app. So in an um, uncorrelated network ensemble, follow a link, we reach a node with degree k, with the probability k pk over average k, right? And this node doesn't have the app, so there's a term 1 minus tk. And for uh, this bit, if the node is infected, that means at least one of his k minus 1 neighbors infect him. So that's the final term. And it's very similar for, for a tk, uh, S, st prime. So it's very lucky that like, we can use this expression to obtain an analytical expression for the critical threshold PC. And it's given by this simple formula. And kappa n kappa t is uh, a function uh, given here. And we want to move one step further to look at the optimization problem. So for instance, in the real world, the uh, the app is only available to a certain fraction of individuals, which is a reasonable assumption. Um, so uh, we can set a constraint saying that uh, the expectation of TK is a given constant. And the optimization problem, we want to maximize the PC. We want to uh, maximize the critical threshold. And the problem gives the heavy side function. So it's indicating that the optimal solution is to have all the nodes of degree k greater than a threshold kc with 100% app adoption. So it's meaning that we, we focus on the hot nodes in the network first. Here is a simulation we run on a random network and also real world networks. So uh, a, B, C, D, a is a random personal network with 50k nodes and B, C, D are real world a friendship network from uh, these are in three uh, network, uh, three countries, Romania, Hungary, and Croatia. And if you look at this, this figure, the, uh, the green triangle is the Monte Carlo simulation for KC equals to four, meaning that for the, the, the degree, the node with degree higher than four in this network have adopted the app. And this uh, black solid line is a result from message passing equation. So you can see this message passing equation agrees very well with the Monte Carlo simulation. And the uh, blue dot and the dash line represents kc equals to k. So we make the k as the maximum number of degree in the network, which means that no 
nodes can adopt this app. So it re represents a normal scenario without this app adoption. So you can see there is a pretty good improvement if we apply this uh, app adoption. And for uh, B, C, D, there are uh, different uh, networks for us to validate this algorithm. And you can see that improvement is different for uh, different networks. I want to investigate a further improvement on PC. So we want to compare this strategy we mentioned before uh, with other strategies. So we modify the TK a little bit. We introduce a term row, represents a random adoption. So when KC goes to infinity, uh, the TK equals a row. So represent a purely random strategy saying that all the people have the same probability to adopt, adopt it app. And when row equals to zero, that's represents the optimal strategy to, to target at the, the hub nodes. And then we, if we plot a phase diagram uh, in, in terms of PC as a function of row and, and KC. So as you can see, for a, a given row, for a given level of random adoption, a smaller KC will always give a very good improvement on the uh, critical threshold PC. So finally, in conclusion, our message passing theory is able to predict the epidemic threshold in a population adopting a tracing app. And from the calculation, we know that the optimal strategy for the app, for the app adoption under a constraint, like uh, a certain fraction of node can adopt the app, that's a constraint, is targeting high degree nodes. Finally, the theory captured the nonlinear effect induced by the app adoption on the epidemic spread. Finally, this is a reference. This is our uh, paper on archive. If you're interested, you can check it out. Thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. So thank you. Thank you very much, Hanlin, <clears throat> for the nice, uh, the nice talk. Uh, we run one minute uh, uh, late uh, 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 on the schedule, so uh, I, can I can allow for uh, uh, questions. Uh, I invite the people okay. who want to make questions uh, to use the chat. Okay. This yeah. way we can run on time, so sorry for that. Uh, no problem. Um, <clears throat> Argiris, are you there? Did you solve the problem? I hope it is solved. I hope. And I am so sorry about before. Don't worry, don't worry. We are... On, 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 almost on time, so let's try again. Can you see my screen now? Yes, now we can see the screen. And we can see the slide. <clears throat> Hello everyone, my name is Argeri Simo, and I'm presenting a simulation of an epidemiological model on networks. As we all know, COVID-19 has huge impact on economy and society. So it is reasonable that a lot of researchers have been focused on epidemiology. And in this study, we will simulate an epidemiological model inspired by Dirk Brockman. This model takes into consideration the impact of uh, quarantine measures. Our objective is not only to produce results that agree with the model, but also having realistic parameters of the simulation. The model is named SARX, and it divides the population into four states. As the susceptible, either infected are the recovered, and takes the quarantined individuals. Except from the typical processes which govern the spread of the infection, such as the transmission of the infection to an S individual and the recovery of an I individual, the model also includes quarantining. Due to quarantining, individuals will be removed from the transmission process. The changes in public behavior, such as social distancing or wearing masks in public, will affect the same the populations of best and die individuals. So in the model with rate kappa zero, S individuals will be considered R 
and die individuals will be considered eggs. Moreover, it is a fact that symptomatic individuals will be quarantined. So with rate kappa, I individuals will be considered X. The differential equations that govern the dynamics of the model are presented with SI, R and X are the number of the individuals in those states at certain time steps and then the number of the population. A different approach would be to apply Monte Carlo simulations on networks. In other words, for every possible event that could be a process such as transmission or recovery, we create random numbers and if the random number is lower than the probability of the occurrence of the event, then we observe the events. The networks will be ertos rainy networks, as they have been used multiple times in the literature to represent social networks. Each node of the network will represent an individual and the links will illustrate contacts. In a recent paper of Brockman, those equations, those differential equations have been solved for several provinces of China, having alpha and beta constant, where alpha and beta are rates which govern the transmission and the recovery of the infection and are characteristic of the infection. And the set of changing parameters of kappa and kappa zero. These parameters change until the best fit of uh, X to the confirmed cases, which will be referred to as real data, is found. In our work, we focus on comparing differential equations to simulation. In order to do that, initially we set a minimum in uh, kappa. We said kappa minimum is 0.2. As after many trials, we have concluded that if it's not set, then the average scale for which the simulation fits to the differential equations is unreasonably high. Then, we solve the differential equations for several countries and find the parameters for which X fits real data. After that, the differential equations are solved again, having kappa and kappa zero equal to those of the previous step. And uh, we lower the population. This step is critical as we compare the differential equations to simulation, which is computationally costly. Then we apply uh, simulations in the same countries and obtain the X for different values of average K. We present the X that uh, fits best in the X of the differential equations. Okay. After applying the differential equations of SIRX in several countries, we present X as a function of time. We observe that the X, the fit of X of differential equations, which is the plot here in our plots, to real data is good for many countries. Real data is the red dots in the plot. The x-axis is uh, time and it is counted in days. For the same countries, we lower the population, apply simulations, and solve the differential equations for for uh, 
like this uh, value of n. Then we present dx of the simulation and dx of the uh, of the differential equation. You observe that dx of the simulation, the blue dots in our plot fits dx of the differential equations, the black curve in the plot, with realistic values of average k. Finally, we want to compare simulation and differential equation, equations for the actual plot of uh, countries or provinces. In order to do that, we will follow the same procedure, but without lowering n. We will uh, follow this procedure for countries relatively small, with the biggest of them being Guadalupe, having uh, around half a million uh, nodes population. We can see that the feet of x of the simulation, the blue dots in the plot, and x of the differential equations, the black curve in our plot, is good to the real data, the red dots in the plot. <coughs> to summarize, Uh, we conclude that uh, the differential equations of the model fit adequately for many countries. For the countries that the differential equations fit, the simulation also fits to the differential equations for lower, for a, a low population. However, we have also observed that uh, for bigger population, the simulation also fits to real to uh, differential equations. Thus, we expect that if we run a simulation with population equal to the actual population of a relatively big country, then it would fit a deeper too. And that's the end. Thank you for your attention. So thank you, thank you very much, Argiris, for for the talk. There is one question and time also for for one question uh, from <clears throat> Sina. Uh, he is asking, do you also take into account a susceptible population quarantining themselves? I assume it otherwise uh, based on the diagrams. Uh, the susceptible population is also quarantined, but uh, the model assumes that they are quarantined uh, by transposing them to the R state. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, so, so basically, uh, they are like quarantining themselves for the rest of the time. They have no chance of getting back to the population, right? Uh, yes, exactly. Mm. Thank you. They way they are removed from the transmission process. Mm -hmm. So, is there yes. any? Can I yes. Ask? Um. Uh, okay, let me let me unmute myself. Okay, um, if you you fitted your data, for instance, I I wonder, uh, the, I just noticed data for Serbia compatible yes. K average K is fifteen, which is probably true. But if you fit the data just from second or third wave as they have, would you would you notice some difference in this on this level of of, the, of dynamics? There's some um, because, differences in the mechanism. Mm -hmm because i couldn't hear you exactly did you ask if, if you, i if yes you can fit uh, if you start your fitting with uh, data from third wave or okay. 
for instance, in Serbia, they had first wave uh, mm -hmm. practically stopped um, after the, these uh, strong measures, and then they have second wave. If you start uh, fitting from there, where already viruses are spread to a certain, a certain level, you know, would you uh, notice some difference in the dynamics on this level of the equations? I think we probably would, but okay. uh, this study is about the first wave. Yeah, yeah, so I, I noticed I, that. I noticed that. But I if you if you extend uh, it, maybe you'll find some differences in the mechanisms. Yes, I believe so. Okay, thank you. So thank you for uh, for the question. Any other question? We have just one minute before finishing the session. So I see no one in the chat, and if anyone else is taking the word, let me thank again uh, the speaker, and uh, thank you all for uh, attending this uh, session on uh, epidemiology. So thank you very much and bye.